The Tom Woods Show, episode 536. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Christmas is coming and chances are you're going to be doing a lot of online shopping. Well, why not get cash back at virtually all the retailers you're going to be using anyway? Sign up for Ebates and you'll get just that. Check it out through tomwoods.com slash Ebates. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm talking to Jason Stapleton, host of the Jason Stapleton program, which broadcasts Monday through Friday. You can check it out at jasonstapleton.com. Jason gives a libertarian spin on current events every single weekday. So we have a a little bit in common here. I'm a podcaster, and his program is available in podcast form. You can download it through various uh, podcatchers. If you are interested, by the way, in breaking into the podcasting game yourself, I remind you that you can check out a free podcast course that will take you from no podcast and no equipment to the basic equipment you need and the basic setup you need, step-by-step to a thriving podcast, It's a very thorough and free course, and check it out at tomwoods.com slash podcast course. Let's turn to Jason Stapleton now. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me. It is great talking to a fellow libertarian talk guy who is in the podcasting world as well. There's a lot we have in common, a lot of the same struggles, a lot of the same triumphs, I suppose, a lot of the same subject matter that we cover. So, uh, first of all, Tell me a little bit about your show and what it is that you do Monday through Friday. Your show is just like mine in that sense, Monday through Friday. And then after you're done with that, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of the follow-up question. How did Jason Stapleton come to hold the opinions he holds today, which seem eminently reasonable to us, but not so much to the rest of the country, unfortunately? <laughs> well, um, as I said, I, or as, uh, as you alluded to, I have a, a show that runs five days a week. It's called the Jason Stapleton Program, not because I'm particularly vain, but because I'm not very creative. And it was originally called the live show because I, I and it's shot and we actually do it live. And that was why I came up with the live show. And what I try and do is uh, I'm, I'm going after a, a little different group. I, I want to spread the message of liberty. And I thought the best way I could do that was with an entertainment style show that covered current events. And so I try and look out over the news and pick out news events and what's happening in the world and try and explain why I think libertarianism or liberty and the concept of liberty will create more wealth, more opportunity for more people than any other system ever devised by man. And I try not to be, I try not to be too terribly stringent with that. I, I recognize that there may be a better system than that one, but just I don't think that everyone's ever been created. And that if we can come up with a better one, I'm more than willing to, 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 to juxtaposition. But at right now, that's the best that we have. And I really like capitalism and free markets. And I try and simplify because what I really want to do is I, I want to reach out to people who I've not been introduced to libertarianism or maybe who have a bad taste in their mouth. Uh, you can think of it uh, along the same lines as I know that you're, you're a Catholic, a practicing Catholic. So if you're trying to reach non-believers – uh, one of the things that turns them off is the constant passing of the plate and the, you know, the person beating them over the head and giving them all the rules that they got to follow and ostracizing them if they don't do it right and, and all of that. And I, I really want to get away from that and I want to simplify what it means to be a libertarian. And so I created five basic principles and they're based off of 10 larger principles that I believe, I think it was libertarianism.org put out. And if I could make it three, I would, but five was about as, as few as I could make it. And uh, every day I kind of preach that message of the five basic principles of liberty, which are uh, limited government or a a belief that liberty should be a primary political value, um, tolerance, peace, individualism, and free markets. And that's what I do every day, trying trying to spread that message. How do you come up with new material every day? <laughs> he asks, <laughs> given <laughs> yeah, not entirely coincidentally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I try and look at the news. So I have a, I'm on a very tight timeline. It's an hour long show. I have other businesses that I own and run. And so from about eight o'clock to 10 o'clock is my, is my research time. And so I take a look at what's happening in the world that day. I look through, well, I have a, a producer or someone who helps me produce the show and the two of us scour the news 
And because I, I, I have a pretty clear understanding of what I believe and why I believe it, uh, it makes it relatively easy when I find something, for example, where uh, in the UK here recently, you had uh, the city of London trying to impose a five-minute wait time on all Uber cars. So they're trying to make Uber less efficient because they are just, they, they, they're blowing the taxi cab market out of the water. And we talked a little bit about the economics of that, about the freedom aspect of that. And so I just try and look at what's happening in the world around us and, and be a voice for liberty. How did you, Jason Stapleton, come to your views today? Now, you served in the military for some time. Did that have any role in it? Oh, most definitely. Um, I, the Marine Corps' birthday, this is being, uh, it's, no, Marine Corps' birthday is November 10th, and we are trying to work around an episode where I'm going to bring on some of my military buddies who want to talk about how the authoritarian nature of the military led them to libertarianism. And I was really a little nervous when I started my show because I have so many friends in the military. And I was worried about how my message might be perceived because I'm, I'm very against war. I don't think war is a good thing. And so I was worried because, uh, you mean, Marines are pretty mean, nasty guys. And, and I don't mean that. In, I mean that in the sense that they're war fighters. And, uh, and I was worried about how I might be portrayed and how they might receive the message. And what I found was a lot of them feel exactly the same way I do. And I was in a special operations unit. I did counterterrorism, hostage rescue, uh, explosive ordnance, uh, explosive breaching. I was a sniper for a time in the Marines uh, with 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines Kilo Company. And so I, uh, I, I, I'm, I went all the way to the top. And when I got out, I started working as a mercenary for Blackwater and their cousin, uh, Greystone. So I was very much the neocon. And what happened was I, I went to war and I started to realize that all the stuff that they were talking about, about spreading the message of liberty and democracy around the world, about how we're keeping America safe. And I, I realized all that was a bunch of bull, that we weren't doing any of that. And we weren't accomplishing what the government said we were accomplishing. And they had kind of pulled the wool over the eyes of everybody who raised their hand when they were young and gullible and said, hey, I'm willing to go and fight and, and defend liberty and freedom for America. And while I still think that those are wonderful things for you to be in support of, for a man to raise his hand up and say, hey, I'm willing to, when our nation is and our liberty is threatened, I'm willing to defend that. I'm willing to be the guy who lays his life down. I think that that is an admirable thing to want to do. That's just simply not what the military and the government is constantly engaged in in the 21st century. And so that got me reading uh, a lot and studying a lot. And I ran across a book by Ron Paul, uh, which is The Revolution, a manifesto. And it completely changed my life. It was like I knew I, I, knew I didn't fit in w with Republicans, but I knew I wasn't a progressive. I knew I believed in personal responsibility and, and the sense that I ought to own what I, what I create and what I earn. And when I read Ron's book, it was as though I had read something, a guy had put on paper everything that I believed but couldn't articulate. And from that moment on, I realized that I was a, uh, that I was a libertarian and I started making the move to get out of the contracting business and to, uh, to start another career. And I became a very successful currency trader and started an internet company, that, uh, an education company that uh, has been very, very successful. We've been able to sell uh, a little over $20 million worth of product online. Um, and th that gave me the resources, the financial resources, to pursue this passion of sharing the message of liberty. I love that aspect of your story because I get a lot of people, and I understand why. I understand their enthusiasm, but they, I think, are putting the cart before the horse. They say, well, what kind of job can I get promoting liberty? And maybe that's not the order in which you do it. it. It's a flukish situation the one that I'm in. It's just a series of unrepeatable occurrences that happen for me. But generally, you get a job doing something else, and that gives you the wherewithal to do what you want to do. I mean, otherwise, you're going to be an intern at some think tank the rest of your life. I mean, who wants that? Uh, much better, I think, to do what you do and then be in a position where you can, without having to answer to anybody, put out your own product every single day. No, I, I agree with you. And, and, and one note to, to, to you and to the show that you put together and the message that you preach. And I just I think that you are going to go down 
as one of the great libertarian minds in, of, of our generation, because I'm you and I are about the same age. What you do on your show every day and what you do with your with your books uh, is is just incredible. And people look at that and they say, well, I want to have that kind of impact. I want to, what can I do? And you're right. The, really, the answer is to go and work for some think tank somewhere. And I don't think that's the answer for most people. I think if we're going to really affect change, it happens first in our family and, and second with our friends. And then once we've we've kind of laid that message out, then we move on beyond that. And I, and I think uh, in terms of using your term, putting the cart before the horse, I think oftentimes we as libertarians, think, well, it's an all or nothing thing. Like I'm unwilling to accept any form of taxation at all ever because I believe taxation is theft. So I won't even discuss the idea of a different kind of taxation, taxation that is less oppressive than the current one that we have. And I say, well, you know, our enemy, the progressive, if you want to call him that, the, the socialist, he doesn't think like that. He doesn't look at it and say it's an all or nothing thing. He's more than willing to take a half measure. He's more, and over the past 30, 40, 50 years, he has been inching us towards the progressive state that we now have. And I think if we're going to turn the table back, that we have to start being willing to take inches as well. And that doesn't mean we sacrifice our principles. It doesn't mean we become any less uh, objection, uh, objectionable to the idea of taxation or, or the idea of, uh, of statism. But it's a difference in how we present the message and how we argue the message and, and how we uh, share the message with others. Yeah, let's pick it up there, because you and I talk about so many different topics every single week that we could I'm sure riff on any of those topics, but maybe it might be more interesting to talk about how we talk about the topics, to talk about the presentation of all this, given that you and I are engaged in that and we spend a lot of time around people who devote themselves to spreading the ideas. What are we doing right and what are we doing wrong as you see it? Well, I think what you're I think the things that you're doing are are doing it very right. You have a a very intellectual show. And you bring people on, and it is always about spreading the idea. And you ch you do challenge people, but it never becomes an argument. It never turns into a shouting match or name calling. And, and, you know, I just had uh, a, a deal on my show where I read something from Jeffrey Tucker about uh, libertarian brutalism, and I was using it to illustrate the point that when when you become a character assassinator, when you become someone who, instead of looking to lift people up, seek to beat them down. Um, that you are, you're counter, you're, you're not achieving the end that you want, that you're not achieving the goal that you want. You're not advancing the cause of liberty. All you're doing is you're becoming the nitpicker. You're becoming the guy who spends his day constantly looking for somebody to correct or for someone to call out. And I said, that's, that's not what we want. That's not who we want to be. We want to be a, a group that's constantly lifting people up that we may not agree with each other because to call yourself a libertarian is really to paint yourself with a broad brush. But what we have to be willing to do is always move towards liberty. And so where I think we get it wrong is we, we get under the assumption that we've got it figured out. Uh, one of the things I, I made a comment, I have a private Facebook group and I made a comment about intellectual property. And I said, I can see some scenario where intellectual, it would make sense to have some intellectual property protections. And I had a couple of different people come in the private Facebook group and really chastise me for that. And I even had one go so far as to say, well, you can't be a real libertarian if you believe in intellectual property. And so I went and I found a, an intellectual property rights attorney, a libertarian attorney, and brought him on the show and one of the things that we had a very nice discussion over the course of about an hour, and at the end of it, what we came away with was, this is a very complex issue. And although he and I disagree, certainly there is room for that discussion inside the libertarian community. And I think where we fall apart is we don't work to, we don't work to advance the message together. We spend our time trying to figure out who, who's got the right message and, and who's, got the, uh, who's allowed to call themselves a libertarian or, or whatnot. And I think that that d d does more to destroy what we're trying to build than anything else. All right. Okay. That's good stuff. That gives me plenty to riff on here, so to speak. All right. Uh, now, I, certainly I agree with some of what you said there, because I run into this too. Sometimes when I'm making a joke even, I have to say expressly, by the way, 
this is a joke. I do understand that it would be status to advocate this thing. It's just a joke. Because you know the emails or, are coming. I know the emails are coming. Or it would it would be a thing like, um, you know, I, I know uh, there are people who go to the movies, and every movie they have to judge whether it's libertarian or not, and the whole thing spins around whether it's libertarian. And I just, you know... I don't think anyone can accuse me of not being sufficiently <laughs> devoted to the cause. But there are times in my life when I want to switch that part of my brain off and just enjoy my life. I, let me give you an example. I, there was a time, I highly doubt we're going to do it, but there was a time when I was briefly considering moving to Massachusetts. And the reason for that is I grew up in Massachusetts. It's not because I like the government there or whatever, but I have – I still have family there. Not a lot, but I have family there. I have a lot of friends there. I know the place like the back of my hand, and I have many, many fond memories from Massachusetts. Now, I realize that Massachusetts is a terrible place politically, but my view was, why should I let the SOBs dictate where I'm going to live? Like the, the terrorists have won <laughs> if I let them make that decision. Sure. I got... I got called out on my own Facebook page being told that I would be betraying the cause. So it wouldn't matter wouldn't matter all the tens of thousands of hours of blood, sweat, and tears I've put into this. None of that would matter because I want to live close to my friends. You can't live close to your friends, Woods, was what they were basically saying. And I feel like saying go jump in a lake. Preferably an acidic one. I can't tell you how good it makes me feel <laughs> that that uh, this happens to you too, because I have people who listen to the show literally every day, and and they and and I get folks who come back and chastise me for the smallest thing. One of the things I was saying, I'll give you an example. One of the things I was saying on my show the other day was I said. Um, I think that drugs are terrible, and I think that prostitution is terrible. And I said, although I'm a libertarian and I think if you want to destroy your own body or you want to sell your body for money, that you ought to be allowed to do that. I said, if you ask me my opinion on that, I'm going to try and dissuade you from doing that because I think that that's a terrible thing. And I actually had someone come on the private Facebook group and and uh, question whether my my libertarianess because I didn't think that because uh, he said I wasn't uh, allowing a woman to do with her body what she wills. He just it just he heard what he wanted to hear, and I think to myself, this is what we're fighting about. I mean, this is it's it's ridiculous. Right now, let me jump in here though and say, having said this, that I don't think I don't mean to be saying. That libertarians, and this I think is a problem with some people who have this criticism, they think that this is some un problem unique to libertarians. They're just so focused on differences and on being pure and so on and on. But then I think if that's what you think about libertarians and that they have this unique problem of focusing on nitpicking and so on, you haven't hung around very much with, well, Republicans, Democrats, Marxists, Socialists, uh, whatever. I mean, they're this is a is a human phenomenon that crosses ideological borders. We see it among libertarians because we're the ones we hang around with all day. But I mean, in the Republican Party, it's they're constantly talking about who's a real Republican and who isn't, and you know, it's everywhere. And, and and by the way, and I don't mean to say that that's always wrong. And the reason that I'm, but I am saying that there are times when people go to a. First of all, it's the way they they conduct themselves where we're not actually having a good exchange. We're just uh, yelling at people. That's not helpful. I want to talk about what makes this particular thing this person is saying or doing not compatible with libertarianism. Let's discuss it. Let's hash it out. Uh, but this is something that everybody does, and I think it can be a good thing because especially among libertarians, it, one good thing about us is that we are very um, – well, let's say we're very acutely aware of – the phenomenon of people who little by little want to sell out so that they'll be respectable because we are not respectable on the political spectrum. And we are – as our people get more and more well-known, I can think of some examples of people who got more, more and more prominent and suddenly they want to distance themselves from their libertarian past because there are a lot of non-respectables there. So suddenly they start watching their language, whatever. That does need to be called out. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, and and you can you can be the teacher uh, for for a minute on this because I don't know the answer. Uh, one of the things I look at is the success of the Tea Party and and their ability to come in and affect government in what I would consider to be 
a positive way in many cases. Uh, they, certainly they are not libertarian. Certainly they, they do not hold the same beliefs that we hold. But their ability to affect the Republican Party and really gum up the works for an established uh, statist Republican Party has been amazing. And I look at that and I say, why were they able to do that in a few short years and be able to do what libertarians have not been able to do in, in 30 years? What is the difference, Tom? Why are they having such a successful bout in changing, uh, in changing government that libertarians have not been able to achieve? All right, that is an excellent question, and I want to answer it a little bit in reverse by beginning by looking at where they are today. How's the Tea Party doing today? But I'll flesh that out in just a minute. Let's pause just for this message. All right, I've got a very easy way for you to earn $100. You think, oh my gosh, what is Woods up to? This must be some scam. I ain't no scammer. To the contrary, I have a really easy way for you to earn $100. I've told you about Ebates, this site that you use to get cash back at almost any retailer you can think of online. You go and buy things just the way you would, and you automatically get cash rebates. It's great. TomWoods.com slash Ebates. Here's where your $100 comes in. All you have to do is refer three people to them, and they'll pay you 100 bucks. So let's see. One of your parents, maybe your brother or sister, and one friend. You got one friend? All right, put that together. That's three people. You get 100 bucks for referring three people. How about that? So check the whole thing out. Sign yourself up. Find your three friends. Check it out through TomWoods.com slash Ebates. Get your hundred bucks. All right, that is an excellent question. I'm going to answer it a little bit in reverse and look at how they're doing today. How's the Tea Party doing today? I think today, by and large, they have been absorbed, not everybody, but a lot of them have been absorbed into the establishment precisely because they didn't have enough nitpicking. They didn't have enough people saying, now, wait a minute, this thing is being taken over by D.C. think tanks who have big email lists and just want to milk us for all the donation money they can get from us. They needed more of that because now they've just – I get all these – I don't know how I got on these lists. I didn't sign up for anything from these people. My email address is obviously being sold. I have a strong suspicion who's doing the selling, but that would have to be on one of my drunk episodes. I'm going to start calling it that. An episode where I would say things I would never ordinarily say is a drunk episode. <laughs> I'm going to – someday when I'm drunk, I'll, I'll, give, I'll name names. But – it's right. Your truth. It's true that at the beginning, boy, did they have some success. And in case people have forgotten, for example, they knocked. I think his name was Bob Bennett, if I remember correctly. Bob Bennett out of Utah was a U.S. senator. They knocked him out of the primary. They didn't just defeat him. He didn't even get. He's an incumbent senator. He didn't even get through the primary because he supported the bank bailouts. And he said. You know, gosh, should, should oh, it was no, it was a reporter who asked the local Tea Party guy, uh, should a man lose his office over just one vote? And his answer was, he will lose his office over that vote. Now that's a fantastic response. Yeah. Now wh how they were able to do that, I think in large part, it simply has to do with the fairly prosaic fact that a lot of them were already local GOP organizing types. I think a lot of them really were already in the Republican Party, and they and so they they knew who the local people were, and they knew who the bad guys were, and I think they were already fairly politically organized, whereas I think of a lot of libertarians have so given up on politics, they're not organized. They, they don't, you know, they don't volunteer at the local precinct and so on and on, so they don't quite know how to carry out something like that. That would be my guess. Let me say one other quick thing, though. I, I have to say this just for the sake of completeness because I can't let a reference to that Tucker Brutalism article go by <laughs> without a comment. I've tried to stay out of that whole thing. Um, I've tried to stay out of Jeff Tucker. I've tried to stay out of the whole drama. If there's one thing I can't stand, it is drama. Actually, that's not true. <laughs> I, I, let me start that over because I love drama as much as anybody else. Let me put it that way, all right? But if it consumes you, then it's a problem. And I don't like libertarian gossip all day long. I can take a little bit of libertarian gossip because I'm human, but I don't really want to hash out who's in what camp and who's doing what to whom. I, you know, come on. I have too much to do. You know, I have too much. But I will say, though, just, just for the record, that. It, that brutalism article, I thought, was an, was an example of character assassination. 
I don't think it was saying to us, let's not engage in those practices. I think it was saying, I, the author, am going to engage in this against unnamed people, we all know their names, so I won't need to name them, who are bad people, who think libertarianism is just all about asserting your right to be hateful and bigoted and unreasonable, whereas the rest of us are humanitarians who want to promote international understanding. I mean, that is a grotesque caricature of what plumb line libertarians believe. And if there is disproportionate, I don't think it is, but if some people think it's disproportionate emphasis on defending the rights of people who are on the outs of society, that's because nobody else will defend them. And it's very, very easy to talk about free trade on the Stossel Show. It is not very easy to defend the rights of some you know, disgusting degenerate who says mean things to people, but who has the right to do that. So I think the way that was done was an absolute textbook example of the way libertarians ought not to treat each other. And then when this, and by the way, when this article came out, it was a big deal, big deal, big deal. Then there was a big backlash, and then the author came out and said, oh, I, I don't know what this big backlash is for. There are only about a half a dozen of these people. Half a dozen of these people, you write a whole article about that's them? Fair. So I, none of it makes any sense to me, and I say the less said about it, the well, better. Well, and, and uh, okay, that's fair. And one of the things I will admit to is that I do not follow the inter-squabbles inside of the libertarian movement. I, I have no idea how, wh what's going on behind the scenes in the libertarian party. I, and, and, and who I, cares? And I, that's exactly right. <laughs> you know? I don't care. So when I read the article, that's not what I read because I am not privy to – as you said, all the people that he that everybody knows he's talking about. I don't know who those people are. I just simply looked at it. When I read it, I said, well, this is an example of someone who is saying, let's lift each other up. Let's make the libertarian movement and the libertarian discussion about humanitarianism and about the good that liberty brings to our lives and not focus on all of the bad, self-righteous things that, that sometimes we get involved with. So I guess, I guess what I'm saying is I read something very different largely because I was not privy to the rest of the discussion. Yeah, whereas I know what's being done in that article Fair and enough. it was not nice. Fair it was not nice. But, but okay, but now, but let's talk Talk about – let's just forget about all the specific names of individuals. Where do you think – okay, so certainly we have a problem with some people who will just spend all their time parsing every single word. And by the way, as I say, that is so not unique to libertarians. I can think of in the old days when I used to really – I used to write a lot in – uh, Catholic traditionalist circles, and I, I met an awful lot of very, very decent priests, and they would say one word that was slightly inaccurate. It's just because when you engage in public speaking or you have a talk show every day and you have to talk at the spur of the moment and you can't go back and edit things, you're going to say something that's wrong, but everybody knows what you meant to say, so it doesn't really matter. And there would be people lined up to tell Father what's what. And I just, no, well, and that's, that's you, what you know? on my show because my show is shot live, and the only way we, the only editing we do is I cut off the dead space at the beginning and the dead space at the end, and we insert a commercial in the middle for a break. But there is everything else is completely there, and so yeah, you do have to understand that I talk for an hour a day, five days a week, uh, and it's just me. And if uh, every once in a while I'm going to use the incorrect term or the incorrect word, and and but it's you cannot make those mistakes in some people's minds. And but I, I, let me just go back one to the discussion about affecting real change because that's what I really want to do. I want to have an effect in a positive way on our world. And I, I look at the Tea Party and I think exactly the way you do. I think the reason that we haven't had the effect is that. We have a group of people who have largely just decided that they don't want to engage in the process anymore, that they don't want to be active, that it is much easier to sit around and have intellectual arguments about what the best society would be. And it's, some of them are even advocating for the total destruction of our current way of life. And I, I say to that – what I want to see is I want to see people get active. I think the way that you change things is internally. The way the Tea Party was successful was they infiltrated the Republican Party. They became a nuisance that turned into a fire. And the, the reason they've lost a lot of that is exactly what you said. They've, turned, they've been absorbed by establishment. So the trick is, and if it can be done, 
is to be able to infiltrate, to be able to cause enough problems inside of the establishment to affect real change and not be corrupted by it. And I don't know if that's possible, but I know that we're in a better position today than we were five years ago because the Tea Party and the Liberty Caucus and some of those types of people and Rand Paul and, uh, and even Ted Cruz and Mike Lee and those guys are creating problems for establishment Republicans inside of government. And, you know, I just I think that's the right way to do it. And I, I just wish that more libertarians would come would come alongside and say, you know what, I will. I'll get out and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll run for office and I'll run and, and try and affect change in a way that we haven't tried before. I can see some of that. My view is pretty much uh, Lou Rockwell's view, which is that if you feel called to do this kind of thing, then go ahead and do it. But at the same time, when I look at the amount of money that is being donated to super PACs, for instance, to Ted Cruz's super PAC, for instance, he's brought in tens of millions of dollars into that super PAC. But th think of the, well, I guess not he himself, but you know what I mean. I Think of what could be accomplished if even a tenth of that money were devoted to creating a K-12 through liberty-based homeschool program like the Ron Paul curriculum and put it on YouTube for free. And, you know, whereas we're never going to remember what any of this super PAC money was ever spent on, but we would forever remember what it was spent on if, if those donors had instead created a homeschool program to teach people these ideas. It, we might. But they won't do we it. We might, but the vast majority of our children are being sent to government-funded schools to be indoctrinated from the time that they're small children until they graduate from college. So spend some of the money explaining to the parents why they shouldn't do that. <laughs> but that, I mean, that's where we go wrong right away, is that the very first lesson these kids learn is if you, th if you think something's really important, like education, then the government will siphon off the resources and hand it to you. That's the very first lesson that they learn. So no wonder they go wrong. They've, they're, they're, they're warped from the moment they walk into that building. L let me say in parentheses, by the way, I— you know, this might sound like special pleading to my audience, but by episode, what are we, 536, they know me well enough to know that I shoot straight with them. And I, I do want to say that one thing that's actually really made me glad about the show is that I haven't really had to deal with the type of people we were talking about. I used to get that on Facebook once in a while, and I think I scared them all away with my responses. Mm -hmm. Because when I do an episode of the show, I'll do a show on something like abortion which is very controversial among libertarians. And I remember I winced thinking, oh, what's the response going to be? And everybody had friendly things to say. I mean, they may have said, okay, the guy should have addressed this issue or that issue, but nobody said, boy, that was a terrible waste of time. I had people who totally disagreed with me on that who said, now that is a model for how you discuss a controversial issue. I, I mean, I get that kind of kind feedback, and it really, really rejuvenates me. It really makes me feel good about things. Well, that's because you're doing it right. And, and I should make a special note, too, that the vast majority of the people who listen to my show um, are, are exactly that way. And it's the great silent majority, that's we might exactly say, right? right? The, I, you know, there are, I have thousands and thousands of people who listen to my show every day. And, I, you know, there's only a handful of people who, who are, are negative and cause problems. So it's not right. But you really are doing it right. One, one of the things your audience should understand is who haven't ever been involved in, in trying to run a show is how difficult it is to interview well. It is incredibly difficult to know how to question, to know how to take the conversation where you need it to go, and to make it feel effortless. And that's something that you do probably better than anybody else I've listened to. Well, that's very kind of you to say. One thing that I actually am happy about with the interviews is that in some cases it sounds like a chat with an old friend, which is how I sometimes want it to be. Can't be with all guests because I don't know them all that well. But one thing that I like is that by this point, I'm 43 years old, and I've spent the last 20-some-odd years reading and studying about some of this material, is that I get, I'm, at, I'm at a point now where... I, you know, I know a little something about a lot of things, so that even though I'm not the expert on these topics, I can have an intelligent enough discussion with somebody who is that the finished product is entertaining and informative for people. That's really what I'm aiming at here. And, and incidentally, what, what you do, because you generally don't have guests on, on your show, I know you're going to make an exception for me someday, but <laughs> hey, I know I, you don't. Hey, wait a minute. 
You have an open invitation on my show. Oh, and- oh and I, that, that's what I meant, actually. Yeah. I, I, I meant precisely Whenever that. Whenever you can, uh, because you're a very busy guy. And so- yeah, I, it's, not, it's, it's gotten better. <laughs> Thank goodness. It's gotten better. But I, I will say that um, what you do, I, f- I would find very difficult. Uh, very difficult, which is what Mike Church did on Sirius XM. Uh, he would talk for three hours, and he'd bring a guest on for one of the hours. But otherwise, it was just him talking. And you can just sit there and riff for an hour. And I used to do that on the Peter Schiff show when we wouldn't get any calls. And I would say, oh, my gosh, no calls. What are we going to do, talk? Yeah. And I would sort of make it work, but I don't have quite that gift that others like you well, have. Well, my, my show, I mean, I always say what, what, I, what I wanted to do is I want them to be entertained and I want them to learn a little something when they walk away. I want them to feel more empowered when they leave. And so um, I've, I, when I ran my, my, my uh, trading company, Trade Empowered is the name of it, and uh, I used to sit in a live trading room three hours a day and, and trade for everybody could come in and watch it. And if there's nothing to do, you got to come up with something. And so I learned real quickly how to fill dead air. And, you know, I used to do it three hours a day. So coming in and doing it for an hour is really a cakewalk. But uh, I, I, that was something that I decided to do. It's a formatting deal for my show. And uh, it differentiates me from, uh, from somebody like you. So people can, they, they feel like they're getting something a little bit different and they can still experience for a guy who's sitting at his desk all day, man, one hour of content just isn't enough. And so I'm trying to uh, to create a space that is unique among libertarian uh, talk in right now in America. Well, I like also the emphasis on current events because on my show, although we do do current events from time to time, and we'll sometimes we'll take an article that somebody wrote that's all wrong about some current event, and we'll take it apart. I the show is more more topical in a in the sense of like a, a dictionary of libertarian ideas. And today I want to talk about insider trading, which we haven't done on the show yet. Or uh, there's some topic that I've, I want to know more about, or I want to f- understand the libertarian position better or whatever. And so I focus on that. And, and a lot of people like that. And some people say, I wish you had more current events. And I, I do get that. But also, it's the part, partly it's the way I prepare the show. I'm, I'm for the sake of my sanity. I'm trying to do five at a time, and then by the time I get to the current event, it's too when late. You're lining up guests the way you do. You just can't possibly be right on top of everything. Um, but uh, hey, oh, by the way, how how is uh, Contra Krugman going? Is how is that? Uh- oh, uh, that's doing well. We just released episode number eight. Over the the well, let's see. I guess by the time this airs, it will have been episode maybe nine. Yeah, because he. Krugman's columns vary so widely Mm -hmm. from week to week. On the one hand, he'll write an article on health care, and you say, well, I expect him to write an article on health care. Then he writes an article on why are middle-aged white men so depressed? (laughs) And his answer is because the Republican Party is terrorizing them with tales of impending doom. Right. But what about the Democratic Party? Like their, Their whole point is that it's there's injustice everywhere and the 1% is sucking up all the opportunities and you can't possibly progress they both have their doom narratives you know so he can't even see that he's kind of blinkered on stuff like that but thanks for asking i mean we like the format it's a two man show and we're having fun with it it's a great show everybody who listens should should go over and check it out it really is good well listen let me give you a final i mean i can't believe we're basically at the end but I want you to say to my audience what you'd like to say. Your website is jasonstapleton.com. Obviously, we'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 536. But anything you want to say to them as we say goodbye today? Well, listen, I just really appreciate you having me on and letting me talk a little bit about what I'm trying to do. And if, guys, if you're, if you're looking for another show, if, if, if you can't, if, if a half hour of, uh, of Tom Woods just doesn't, uh, isn't enough to fill your whole day, come over and check out jasonstapleton.com. You can download it on iTunes. And uh, if you like it, stick around. We have a private Facebook group, jasonstapleton.com forward slash Facebook. That will, uh, it's uh, invitation only, but our standard is rather lax. And you can meet a couple of thousand other people who are just like you, who are trying to figure out how to spread this message of liberty. And, uh, and uh, if not, then that's cool too. I just, uh, I'm really, I'm really pleased that I get the chance to, I feel, feel really blessed that I get the chance to share this message every single day because there are not very many people who have the ability to go out and do it. And I feel like if I have the knowledge and the expertise and the desire that uh, it's something that I should do. And um, I feel very blessed that uh, God gives me the ability to do that. 
Well, Jason, thanks so much for your time. Best of continued good luck with the show. And um, as I say, one of these days very soon, we'll, uh, you know, perhaps we'll be talking over on your platform. Uh, thanks so much again. Thanks, Tom. All right, everybody. TomWoods.com slash 536 is the show notes page. Jason mentioned Ron Paul's book, The Revolution, A Manifesto. We will link to that as well as to Jason's program at the show notes page. But also, I just want to point out that you can get the audiobook version of The Revolution, A Manifesto for free through TomWoodsAudio.com. Tomorrow, Kevin Gutzman returns to the show, and we're going to look at an article that appeared in National Review contrasting Hamilton and Jefferson, and you can take a wild guess as to which one they favor. We're going to take that article apart and have some fun doing it. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.